Hello, I'm Norman Swan. Welcome to this program on prostate health, taking it seriously. And we're coming to you on the Rural Health Channel. I'd like to acknowledge that we are broadcasting from the land of the Gurungai people of the Gadigal clan, traditional custodians of the land, and we acknowledge their elders, past and present. Tonight, our panel will focus on the complexities and challenges associated with prostate health. How to encourage men to get regular checkups, maybe, the conflicting and confusing advice around testing, and the various management and treat treatment options that are available. We'd also love to hear from you with your questions and comments. And tonight we're being broadcast, webcast live, so for those who are watching us via the internet, you can type your question for the panel in the question box, or if you're on a mobile device, congratulations, and slide across to the questions button and type in your question there. For those of you watching the traditional way, how boring of you, on television, you can reach us by email, text, phone, or even you can tweet us. The details are on your screen now. You can send your emails to questions at rhef.com.au. You can text us on 0408 408 932. Or you can phone us on 1800 646 015. And you can tweet us at, at ruralhealthed or hashtag RHEF. Now let me introduce our panel to you. Dan Hobbs is a general practitioner in Lightning Ridge, New South Wales. Welcome, Dan. Thank you. Dan spent many years traveling and practicing both general practice and hospital medicine in many outback areas across Australia. Stuart Wilder is a men's health nurse practitioner based in Hamilton, Victoria. Welcome, Stuart. Thank you. Does a nurse practitioner mean that um, you can remove prostates yet? Not yet. Not no. yet, but you're waiting. <laughs> no. You're waiting. <laughs> That'll be a while. Stuart's current role is with the Western District Health Service as a men's health consultant and prostate cancer case manager. Alan Hopgood is an actor, playwright and survivor of cancer, as prostate cancer from 20 years ago. Welcome, Alan. Thank you. Alan's spoken and written of his experiences in a book and also plays. And Jeremy Grummet is an or a urological surgeon and chair of the genital urinary cancer multidisciplinary team at Alfred Health in Victoria. Welcome, Thanks Jeremy. Alan. And uh, is adjunct senior lecturer at Monash University. So welcome to you all. Uh, Jeremy, um, people are watching us who aren't necessarily practitioners and may have, and maybe even some practitioners have a confusing view of what the prostate actually is. Why don't you give us a primer on the prostate? Okay, I'll try and keep it brief. But um, so the prostate is a gland that sits in the pelvis of men only, it should be pointed out. Um, and it sits directly below the bladder, but it's also right in front of the rectum or the back passage. And that's why when we want to do a physical examiner, examination of the prostate, we can, we can actually feel it via the rectum. And what it does is basically allow nutrition and transport for sperm. So it provides fluid so that when a man ejaculates, most of the fluid that's coming out is actually from the prostate. So it's a reproductive gland, really? Absolutely, yep. So it, it has no role, no role in the urinary system apart from being in an awkward spot which can cause problems? Correct. And do women have a vestige of it? Because <laughs> they say that, they, they say that, that, that that's the case. The, but perhaps the, we're getting, but a male urologist is perhaps we're getting beyond your area of expertise here. There's vestiges on both sides, actually. It's, it's actually a very fascinating topic, but uh, in terms for of another time. that question, for another time, right. perhaps. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> keep your thoughts to that. Alan, what's your story? My story is that uh, 20 years ago, I had surgery for prostate cancer. And uh, being a writer, I wrote my experience up as, first of all, a book and then a play. Because back then, there wasn't really much going on with men's health. Thank God, now it's all over the place. But I toured that play quite widely. And the most important thing about it was I made it a comedy. Because it was my story, I could make jokes about it, right? And because I could make jokes about it, people were able to sit through the play. And was it a one prostate show? I uh, beg your pardon? Was it a one prostate show? <laughs> no. A one hander, a as they say? Show. It was. No, so uh, I found that that actually um, uh, men appreciated the fact that I was totally honest about my experience. Mm -hmm. When I wrote the book, I included all the fears that I had pacing the floor at four o'clock in the morning. Because, as you know, it's a very original disease in which there is an element of choice as to what you do about it. And that's what I grappled with. And fortunately, I left it in the book, and that's what uh, uh, echoed with men and their partners. Because, let's face it, it's a situation for the man and his partner. And you went for a prostatectomy? Uh, yes, I had it out, yep. And no recurrence? 
Hmm? No recurrence. No, no. All is well. 20 years later, something must have worked. I'm still here. <laughs> and we'll come back to the pros and cons and those choices uh, later on in the show. Uh, Stuart, a lot of people are talking about prostate health. Is this just a, a bandwagon and, um, or is there actually something to it? Oh, I think as Alan has pointed out, there's a lot more interest now in men's health. I think we've uh, probably taken a bit of a leaf out of uh, the women's health movement and we're we're using some of our avenues such as sporting um, organisations, et cetera, to actually promote a little bit more awareness of uh, men's health. In terms of the prostate, is it beefed up about um, issues relating to prostate? They've always been there. As uh, Jeremy and Dan will both say, they've been there for, for a long time and um, probably it's about time we actually took it a little bit more seriously because it certainly is a condition, the three conditions, that um, cause a lot of problems and heartache for men and women. So. Is there a way of keeping your prostate in good shape? Oh, I think there's a way of keeping your <laughs> prostate in good shape. Um, some research did highlight about the uh, sexual activity was a, an enhancer of, um, I'm not sure of the evidence-based practice of that. But, well, there um, was some suggestion that sexual activity is positively associated with cancer, the more sexual activity, higher risk of prostate cancer. And there was also um, research about the more activity of the uh, sexual activity or ejaculations reduce the risk of prostate cancer too, thank but goodness, I'm not thank sure. Thank goodness for that. Yeah, so look, <laughs> we won't go okay, there. Okay, so we'll leave that behind. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Flick. Uh, diet, because people have yeah. talked about saturated fat. Is there any Absolutely. truth to that? Look, it, I think in general, and, and it goes across the board with you know all risk factors associated with prostate health, um, keeping good weight, good diet, nutrition, exercise, reducing the alcohol consumption, keeping the, uh, the waste measurement, uh, to the appropriate level, they all contribute to, to overall general health and obviously the overall general health will improve the prostate health too. So there's still a lot of research so needs is, is to So is that be an done. act of faith or actually there's evidence behind uh, it? There is some evidence associated with girth measurement in terms of uh, belly measurement and um, obesity seems to alter sometimes your PSA readings as well so you need to make some adjustments for that but um, certainly alcohol is one of those factors that um, it may be bandied around and certainly needs a little bit more research as well. Yeah, I think there is an association between obesity and the more aggressive forms of prostate cancer. So that, mm. that is one of the risk factors that men can actually do something about. And what about aspirin? You know, there's a, you know, there is some evidence that aspirin reduces the incidence of various cancers. Is there any evidence of that with prostate cancer? Nothing conclusive within prostate, no. And family history, Stuart, what's the role of family history? Yeah, family history is probably the, the, the true one that we've found that has definitely got an indicator of uh, that we need to be aware of. And uh, so if there is a family history of prostate cancer, then certainly men should be aware of that. They should acknowledge what age their father or uncles or grandfathers had that disease. And that should be taken into account on whether they go, when they go to their GP and discuss the options of screening for that. So that probably is our only major one as, as such with um, African American and... Uh, so the ethnicity does have a... It does have a bearing, yeah. Uh, and certainly family history, but they're probably about the only two to three that have really had the big link. So Southeast Asian origin, Chinese, Vietnamese, yeah, they, they have, have a lower incidence. They had lower and now potentially because of our, their diet is changing to a more Western diet, it is actually rising, the last report. Oh, because I thought that um, African Americans had a high, I can't remember the name of the enzyme now, but the enzyme that's yeah. suppressed by dutasteride and those other um, drugs, um, that they have a high level and Asian mm. ethnicity people have Lower, lower levels of that enzyme that produces testosterone. Yeah, I'm not sure about the enzyme, but, but in terms of risk um, with eth ethnicity, that's absolutely correct. So mm. it's certainly higher in uh, African Americans and lower in Asians. So what can go wrong, Dan? Well, there's three main things that present to us in primary care, um, or indeed in medicine. Prostatitis, BPH, benign prostatic hyperplasia. Or that's an enlarged cancer. prostate. That is an enlarged prostate. But again, I'd stress the word benign. It's, um, well, benign, it doesn't hurt you. And prostate cancer, which is the least likely, I'll stress, of all of those diagnoses to affect men. So although it's a common cancer in men, it's not a common ca cause of problems with prostate. Absolutely. So, but Stuart, some people suggest that prostate problems are actually normal as men age. It's not actually an abnormal situation. Yeah, it's totally normal. It's a, it's a part of us growing older and uh, certainly as we grow older our cellular structure changes and, and in particular in the prostate we know that the majority of men if they live to a fruitful age of around 80 are probably going to have some sort of issue with their prostate. It doesn't mean it's going to be cancer but it may be enlargement or it may be you know, another associated issue with lower urinary tract symptoms. So.
And what symptoms are or are not signs of a prostate problem, Dan? Commonly men will present with um, difficulty passing urine, either starting or stopping or even having to put more force in to get the stream to do the same thing. Often they'll need to go more often during the day or um, even getting up during the night two or three or even more times. And um, in certain cases like prostatitis, sometimes it even hurts to pass the urine or even to ejaculate. So what is prostatitis? Do we know? We do. There's um, numerous versions of prostatitis, I think four at last count. Jeremy might correct me there. But um, there's bacterial and non-bacterial prostatitis. Um, yeah, so um, obviously... So infectious or non-infectious? Indeed. So you can get an inflammation in the prostate for something else going on in your body or it can be infected for some reason. And we'll come back to that in a moment. Jeremy, what about incontinence as men age? Does that get anything to do with the, um, the men find that they can't control the urine or they find that they dribble into the... Incontinence is actually reasonably rare or significant incontinence. It, I, I guess it depends on how you define it as with all these things. Um, dribbling, um, for example, just after you've been to the toilet to urinate is actually pretty common, but we don't typically define that as incontinence. Um, the dribbling is, is, as I say, common. Incontinence, not so, not so common, unless you've had a treatment for a prostate disease that may put you at a higher risk for developing incontinence. But prostate diseases themselves rarely cause incontinence, unless you've got a really severe episode of prostatitis where you're rushing to go to the toilet and you just can't make it. And why does the prostate gland enlarge as we get older? It's a great question. We, I don't think we really know the, the true answer to that, but probably the most accepted theory is that it's um, interactions of hormones within the prostate gland that are causing enlargement. And is there any relationship at all between prostate enlargement and prostate cancer? No. So the fact that you've got a large prostate or a small one does not mean you're at higher or lower risk of prostate cancer. Correct. The problem is that both of those conditions occur coexist. in a, in a re they coexist and they also c occur in around the same age group as well. And that causes some of the, uh, the confusion. And people talk about, um, you know, it's getting technical for the non-medical non -medical audience now, but um, urologists often ask or GPs often ask to have an ultrasound. You know, you fill up your bladder, you have the ultrasound and then you pass water and then they also they redo the, blood, the, the bladder ultrasound to see how much urine is left inside your bladder. What's that test trying to achieve? <coughs> Pardon me. I guess it's trying to look at um, efficiency of, of bladder emptying. Um, and, if and what's important about that? So if, if the man leaves, is leaving behind a large amount of urine, despite having just been to the toilet, that's an indicator. It's not proof, but it's an indicator that uh, he, he's likely to have a degree of outlet obstruction. And that may be um, causing some symptoms but also it means that he may be at increased risk of going into what we call acute retention. And that's where, that's an emergency basically because you can't pee at all. And the only way to fix that is by insertion of a catheter. Preferably by somebody who knows what they're doing. Preferably. We've got a question here from um, Victoria. Hi, I'm very interested in the panel's view on complementary and alternate medicines used such as lycopene, vitamin E, sol palmetto and acupuncture. Uh, research has shown that up to 50% of men do not inform their treating physician that they're taking complementary medicines. How can you ensure that they do tell you? And what do you think about those complementary medicines? Oh, don't rush to answer <laughs> the question. Okay. If I can, uh, you go ahead if you like, but, uh, but if I can make a comment on that. Um, there have been some trials now looking at lycopenes in tomatoes, um, vitamin E, selenium, uh, in fact, there was a large one with those two recently. Which so they were cancer prevention yes. rather than treating. But some of them are used to treat benign prostatic hypertrophy. Uh, some are for cancer prevention. The saw, well, the saw palmetto in particular is, is used to treat um, benign enlargement of the prostate. Now, if you go to uh, um, uh, a group of the best medicine, um, which is the, the Cochrane Review, So meta-analysis where they bring together the randomised trials. Right then that tells us that saw palmetto doesn't appear to be any better than placebo. So um, I don't think it's causing any harm by taking saw palmetto, but um, in terms of the best evidence of, of available, it doesn't appear to, to do much good either. And vitamin E, antioxidants, um, minerals like selenium as prevention? For, for prevention of benign enlargement, we don't have any evidence and to support cancer? that. And, and lycopenes, maybe that's still up in the air, but unfortunately, um, selenium and vitamin E have been ruled out. 
in reasonably large randomized yeah. trials. Yeah. I think the last one with the lycopene showed that um, it was probably a little bit more effective uh, with traditional tomato-based products and the lycopene that you naturally get out of that rather than taking a supplementation of it. So, so do Italians have less <laughs> pros prostate cancer? Well, I think in the Mediterranean, I'm not sure um, whether there's any difference right. in their, their diet in terms of uh, risk. The acid test, as they could say. Be. Hmm. Could be. Um, we've got a few more questions there, which I'll come to a little bit later. Please uh, send in your questions. So if, you've, if you're not watching us on the internet, you can f SMS us on 0408. 408932. You can phone us on 1 800 646 or you can uh, send us an email at questions at rhef.com.au. You can tweet us at rural health ed or hashtag rhef. Or uh, on the internet, you can go to the questions box and uh, send us a question, and people already are. Um, and uh, please keep on sending them in. Uh, let's go to our first case study. John, who's aged 42, comes to see you, Dan. He's got uh, passing water frequently. He's got a bit of discomfort when he does. And he's got a bit of pain below the belt, just you know, above his pubic area. Hmm. 42. No other history. You, you know, he's, he's memory. He comes to your practice, but you haven't seen him for ages. Absolutely. Well, at 42, um, the good news is that John has very little to worry from cancer. And Considering the publicity around prostate cancer, understandably, it might be the first thing in his mind. But the role of the GP here, apart from, of course, diagnosing and treating the problem, is going to be addressing any concerns and questions John may have. Just reassuring him that the chance of cancer is tiny and that it's very likely to be simply resolved by a course of antibiotics. So you think this is what? Prostatitis, most likely. So infectious. How would he have caught prostatitis? We often don't know. There are a number of ways that it can be caught. In young sexually active men, it is um, more commonly related to gonorrhea, the sexually transmitted disease. But um, there's a numerous other organisms that can be implicated, and it is thought that it may spread directly from the rectum or through um, the lymphatic system, which is part of the immune system. So it could be a sexually, a sexually acquired infection? In a small number of people, yes. Some people have related prostatitis to, to cystitis in women. Have you seen that in your practice? I haven't, no. So well, how do you treat it? Do you go to do tests? Um, there's several ways of approaching the matter. Um, usually the easiest test to do would be just to do a urinalysis, um, and that's usually as far as we need to take it with someone such as John. Um, and then um, the next step in management would be just a course of antibiotics, either cotrimoxazole or ciprofloxacin. Right, cotrimoxazole being the one that you'd go to first because it's simpler and cheaper rather Absolutely. than ciprofloxacin which is a much more advanced and expensive one you, want to, you don't want to use a lot of. What else would you do for him if you turned up like this? Because um, you be haven't seen him for a while and he's absolutely. 42. It would be worthwhile doing um, some general health measures, asking him about his lifestyle, diet, smoking, and of course um, raising the question of blood pressure, cardiovascular health and things. But um, certainly at 42 he won't be worrying about prostate cancer or screening for that matter. And. Would you check his partner as well if you think it could be a sexually acquired infection? Yes, it's a good opportunity to ask about sexual history and behaviours um, and um, in a confidential fashion. And if that is considered to be a risk factor, then we can address that issue. Um, that's a matter of diagnosing the issue, first off. Stuart, do you see a lot of men with prostatitis? I see a few um, like that in my travels. And certainly, yeah, it is. It, it's, it, pretty well textbook, most of these guys are younger um, and they come in with a, a fairly traditional sort of, I was fine last week and now I'm going to the toilet all the time and I feel like I'm peeing razor blades and things are you know, not going that well and uh, they're very concerned. And um, a lot of the guys in that certainly age group would be concerned about, test, about um, prostate cancer, but yeah, most commonly it's a reassurance, it's about getting the right treatment, doing the screening test and then, um, and then moving forward from there. Jeremy? Yep. So, so I guess what we're talking about at the moment is, an, is acute prostatitis and, and you know sometimes that's bacterial um, as, uh, as has been mentioned already um, but sometimes um, you can have a chronic prostatitis so in other words you can have these sorts of symptoms that just sort of go on and on. Grumble for, along for a they, long time. They grumble along, they, they go for maybe months and they might be intermittent over that period as well. They're the ones that are a bit harder to treat and sometimes they'll require a referral to a, a specialist, a urologist 
um, who might then instigate uh, perhaps a, a, another type of antibiotic that might be a little bit more high powered, a little, little bit better, better penetration into the prostate. And, but sometimes there's nothing to find. Yeah, that's right. Um, and that can, be, that can be pretty tricky sometimes. Can it be a sign of another disease? Um, yeah, it could be. I think you've, you've always got to keep your mind open if, the, if your diagnosis doesn't appear to be right or if the treatments you're instituting aren't working. Um, but as long as you've essentially ruled out any nasties, you've done a, you've done a urine test, you've made sure there's no actual blood in the urine, um, you've got no signs of infection. And, and, and when you look at the prostate glands of men with these chronic symptoms, so they've got chronic problems with passing urine yep. and discomfort and so on, when people have looked at the prostate gland, so is it abnormal? Um, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, so um, uh, in terms of the actual tissue, is that what you're getting at? Yeah, because sometimes this could be what's called a chronic pain syndrome where they might have had acute prostatitis, it's long gone, but they're left with the pain rather than, which has got no, right. and there's no physical abnormality left, it's just the pain. Yeah, that's right. Um, and so, you know, that can be a pretty difficult situation because uh, we don't always have very good or effective treatments for that. Um, and sometimes it's, it's a matter of reassurance. Sometimes we will use an anti-inflammatory, um, just a simple anti-inflammatory medication, and sometimes we'll even use um, medication to relax the uh, pelvic floor muscles and the, and the surrounding smooth muscle uh, and, e and even refer to um, pelvic floor uh, physiotherapy as well. I was actually going to ask Stuart earlier but when we we're talking about we'll come back to the prostate health in general mm -hmm. <laughs> some physios are promoting uh, pelvic floor exercises for men saying that I mean did you have them Alan when you were? I do them every day. Right and does it help? Uh, yes, yes, I'm mildly incontinent, but uh, certainly it's been kept in check. Uh, but yes, every day, get down on me back and do them. I hope you're doing them while you're sitting here. <laughs> you can, when I, uh, I can actually. When your yes. facial expression changes, I'll know that you're doing them. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, is there any evidence for that? Yes, uh, certainly, you know, lots of um, uh, patients are referred to uh, continents. Um, nurses or health professionals or physiotherapists with a background with continence and uh, certainly assists and certainly when we talk about prostate cancer uh, in the pre-limb to surgery or the post, um, yeah, it works extremely effectively. Is there any evidence that they do better after surgery? After surgery, um, they, seem, they seem to do better with pelvic floor exercises, but were you talking about just generally to pelvic floor exercises in men? Um, well, not. Um, I'm actually talking about. We'll come to it later. But you know, in preparation for surgery, people oh, okay. talk about yep. penile exercises as well as as pelvic exercises. Uh, yeah, not much evidence on. Well, conflicting evidence on penile exercises, if you like, in terms of maintaining erections. But mm. pelvic floor exercises are certainly well established. Yeah. Good. So let's just go back over chronic prostatitis quickly. So chronic prostatitis may be infective and we would always try and rule that out first um, and we would do that by giving a, uh, a course, of, perhaps a prolonged course of antibiotics, it might even be for you know, four to six weeks and if there was ongoing symptoms after that, when, then we've essentially ruled out the infection then sometimes as I say we might give an anti-inflammatory or another medication to relax the bladder outlet. Does it increase your risk of cancer in the end? No, it doesn't appear to be related. Let's go to our next uh, case study. William's 75 years old and comes to see Dan with uh, bothersome symptoms. He's getting up at night, he's passing urine a lot, he's dribbling a bit and he's just a bit concerned. Understandably so. At 75 years of age we're thinking much less about prostatitis. That's the least likely diagnosis in William here. Um, it's um, most likely BPH and less likely cancer of course. And what are you going to do for him? Investigate. BPH so being benign prostatic hypertrophy, yes, large, indeed. yep. Yeah, well, um, investigate and educate um, I, are the first lines. So we want to do urinalysis, we want to consider doing ultrasound scans, um, the, and of course doing a PSA test possibly, and then talking with William about his concerns about possible cancer and things like that. Why would you do a PSA test? Because my understanding is that symptoms like this are not symptoms of cancer. You're right, um, cancer is less associated with urinary symptoms, but um, because the two can coexist and um, occasionally they can be associated, we would definitely not want to miss that diagnosis if present. And the statistics are significant, aren't they, aren't they Jeremy? The statistics of enlarged prostate. 
Oh, in terms of how common they are, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, uh, as you were saying, sort of alluding to before, I mean, they're so common that you could almost describe them as part of the normal ageing process. But I guess what's really important in this patient and, and in any man of this age who presents with these sort of urinary symptoms, uh, how much is it bothering him? That's really the crucial question in, in, in this uh, sense because uh, as long as you've ruled out nasties by which you know, you, there's, no blood, there's no blood in the urine, there's no other sign of anything nasty going on, then you would proceed to uh, a simple treatment, but only if he's bothered. If he's got urinary symptoms and he's worried about cancer, but you do a rectal examination and it feels fine, then you can reassure him and you can start a simple medical treatment. What's an ultrasound going to show you? So an ultrasound, I guess an ultrasound has a couple of um, uses here. Um, we talked before about how much urine is being retained after, after urinating. And if there's a large amount, let's say it's half a litre or f three to 500 mils, then that makes... Well, you'd be gurgling, wouldn't you? If you <laughs> you'd be surprised that some people um, with an over-distended bladder can even hold up to about two litres. Two litres? That's extreme. That's extreme. But we're worried that... Um, if, if that's allowed to develop and worsen, then he may have a situation where he can't pass urine at all. So he's, he's teetering on the edge? Yeah, potentially, if, if he's got really high residual volumes. The other thing that an ultrasound can potentially help you out with, you might have done a re rectal examination, got a bit of an estimate of prostate size, but again, we're only really feeling the back of the prostate, so it's pretty subjective. And an ultrasound might help give us a better estimate of the actual prostate size. So you do a rectal examination on William, you let you add him, and it's, it feels pretty big but it's soft, there's, nothing, there's no hard bits to feel. Mm. Are you still going to do a PSA on it? Yes, quite reasonably, I think so. Do we, I mean, Jeremy, do we have an, an assessment of, because the closest correlation for PSA is the size of your prostate. Correct. Rather yep. than an indication of cancer. Um, and, and are you able to adjust the PSA for the size of the prostate gland? Yeah, you do for sure. And, and, and it's, a, it's what we call PSA density. So it's a measure of PSA divided by the actual volume of the prostate. So I think it's reasonable to do a PSA. It's not obligatory in a 75-year-old guy, even if he's presenting with symptoms, but it's reasonable. You can use it as a, as a surrogate for the actual volume, um, as a measure of volume of, of the prostate. Um, and, uh, and you know, if you've got a, an enormous prostate on rectal examination and you do a PSA and it's, even if it's mildly enlarged, then you can be quite confident that it's the benign enlargement that's causing that. So what sort of level of prostate of PSA would you be relaxed about with a reasonably large prostate gland in William? So in this patient, so he's mid-70s, if he's got a PSA, well, let's say he's got a moderately enlarged prostate, say, what, 60, 70 cc's and normal prostate's 30 cc's, you know, if he's got a PSA 6 or 7, uh, maybe 8 or 9 um, in that age group, I, I would be quite comfortable with that. I think that's, that would be considered well within normal and limits. if he was 60 years old and that size of prostate in a PSA of 6 yeah, or 8? different story. So the, the sort of the risk-benefit ratio shifts a bit there because if you're in your 60s and you do have a significant prostate cancer, then you're more at risk of uh, coming to harm from that prostate cancer. So in other words, th the situation doesn't really change. So your, your PSA of 6 or 8, mm -hmm. which for those watching who haven't got a clue what we're talking about, is kind of higher than average, mm -hmm. but it's still likely to be due to the benign prostate. It is. It's not any more likely to be cancer at 60 than it is at 75. It's just that the, what you're saying is the cost of missing the cancer at 60 is greater. Correct. Because you're like, more likely to die of your prostate cancer. Correct. You're more at, at risk of, of that if you've got a significant prostate cancer. You see, prostate cancer can be such a slow-growing disease that if you're in your mid-70s, and even if you do have a small focus of prostate cancer, it's, it's unlikely to cause you harm if it's a small volume. Let's take some questions. We've got some um, questions here on this. Uh, one from New South Wales. Would referral to a urologist be advisable with consistent symptoms of passing nocturia, passing water during the night, hesitancy, in other words, trouble starting, and small urinary vol volume on passing urine, so you know, you're not passing much at a time, despite a PSA that's within range? So I'd probably de defer to Dan on this because I, th I think it really de depends on, um, on, on how much the, the GP has already um, uh, instituted. If, 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 they've, if they've already instituted a treatment and it hasn't worked, sure, a referral. But otherwise, I'd probably leave that in the GP's hand. That's absolutely right. Um, with this sort of case, um, you could quite reasonably trial the treatment 
um, Prazosin, the first line agent, because that sounds a lot like BPH, it's most likely mm -hmm. to be that. Um, and uh, a short course of Prazosin, if he responds to that, then we can leave it for the moment. So for, again, people watching who aren't medical, Prazosin is what they call an alpha blocker, which relaxes the muscles? That's right. Well, it relaxes the smooth muscle at the bladder outlet and, and also the smooth muscle within the prostate gland. So just that first part of the tube where the urine's starting to flow, you can reduce the resistance to flow and allow an easier flow by giving those sorts of medications. So does that make incontinence more likely? No, very good question. So the, the continence mechanism is downstream from the prostate and that's by the, the sphincter, the urethral sphincter, and that's right. a circular I'm crossing muscle. crossing my legs as you speak. <laughs> <laughs> but that doesn't get affected by these alpha blockers, so you're still continent. But prazosin has side effects, doesn't it? Can do, yeah, um, and they're typically cardiovascular, in other words, um, you can get what's called postural hypotension. That's where if you stand up really quickly, you might feel faint because your blood pressure drops a bit suddenly. So and that's the smooth muscle action on your blood vessels. Exactly. And there's another one, um, uh, which is... In terms of ejaculation? No, no, in, term, no, no, in terms of... Uh, there's another alpha blocker oh, out there. Oh, another yeah. alpha blocker. There is. Tamsulosin is another one, and that's more selective um, for the smooth muscle uh, receptors that are, that are located, again, at the bladder neck or bladder outlet and within the smooth, within the uh, prostate. But it's not on the PBS? Not on the PBS, no. Right, so it's, in, it's relatively expensive. And there's, uh, there's also uh, another one which interferes with this enzyme that I was talking about earlier, right. and affects bladder si uh, prostate size. Yeah, that's right. There's, there's actually a whole different family of medication which uh, shrinks the prostate. So it's got a completely different action on the prostate. It shrinks the glandular tissue within the prostate. Um, and uh, that's actually very effective, but it's quite slow to, to, have it, to have its effect. And it might take six months before the patient even notices. And that's dutasteride. That's it's called dutasteride. And um, because you've got one medication um, acting on one part of the prostate and another medication acting on another, they actually work pretty well when combined. And there, there is a tablet that you can have which, if initiated by the, a urologist, is on the PBS, and it works in both ways. And but dutasteride can cause erectile dysfunction. Yeah, it can do, but not all the time. And, and, um, and what we don't know is exactly to what extent, you know, what is the proportion of men, but certainly that is a, a well-recognised potential side effect of dutasteride. Let's just take some more questions. What's currently considered um, a high PSA reading to initiate further investigation? Um, so It depends uh, is the answer, isn't it? Correct, absolutely. So it depends on age, uh, depends on family history, depends on the size of the prostate as, as we've just been talking about. But if we just talk about the PSA level alone and, and just ignoring those other factors for a moment um, and, and look at age, um, then we would generally say that about two and a half to three um, would be an, an upper cutoff for men in their 50s, up to four um, for men in their 60s and perhaps up to seven, eight, nine, even ten, perhaps for men in their seventies. So, and again, that's just simply you don't want to miss cancers early. It's yeah, it's part of that, but it's also taking into account the effect of BPH. In other words, we know that, that your prostate will get larger and your PSA exactly, will go up as you get exactly. older. Exactly. So it takes that into account too. So another another question from Queensland has asked: Is the prostate health index a valid follow-up to PSA concerns? And just you better just explain this because people are trying to refine. It's such a lousy right. test. It, it's yep. a crap test. And um, so the question is: How do you make it a better test for detection? Yeah. So that's a terrific question, and, and that's exactly what we're trying to. I think as urologist, as urological community, we're trying to focus on at the moment is how can we really make our diagnostic tests more accurate uh, and more precise or more, and more um, specific for prostate cancer. The PHI or the PHI um, is one potential way of doing that and it uses things, it actually combines things like the, the total PSA which we would do anyway but also other aspects like the free to total PSA. What's which, that all about? I've heard that before. So the free to total PSA uh, ratio is a, an adjunct if you like and it's an additional test to the PSA and Basically, the way we use it is if you start off with an abnormal total PSA, let's say it's slightly elevated, you can then get a repeat test done incorporating the free to total ratio and that can help us, it's just one more piece of information to help us determine is this elevation due to benign uh, prostate disease, or BPH as we've been talking about, or is it perhaps more likely to be due to prostate cancer? And is that validated? 
Um, or is it just the, the old urologist putting their finger in the no, air? No, no, no. Look, it's, a, it's, a, it's certainly it's validated. It's a well accepted test, but it's not perfect by any means. And, and for, I'll give you an example. Patients will often come back with a free to total ratio that's in what they call the equivocal range. And when it's in the equivocal range, it's really, it's really of no help. But if it's at the extreme end um, of the abnormal range, this is the free to total ratio, then again, that, that can help us decide, do we really need to do a biopsy or can we sit tight and repeat the PSA in say six months time? Right, so that's the, um, I'll come, so why, oh sorry, sorry, I was just picking up another question here from Victoria. Why don't doctors order a free to total PSA along with a PSA test regularly, Dan? Well, where it's relevant, it does get reported automatically by the laboratory, at least where I order tests anyway. Right. Yes. So you do get it back. Yes. Um, so let's go back to William and his situation. So he's not bothered by his symptoms, he just wants a checkup. You do a digital rectal, you do a PSA, and it comes back at about six. You just go through to the keeper, you reassure him, Absolutely. and that's fine. He's bothered by his symptoms. Mm. He's waking up at night, he's tired, he doesn't like the symptoms. Your first line is you try them on the drugs, is that what Indeed. we just talked about? Unfortunately, um, as you are pointing out earlier, the only um, medicine that's available for, BPA, for BPH on the PBS is prazosin, at least for GPs. The next, if, if the man gets adverse side effects, as Jeremy was telling us about, or if he doesn't respond to it, then um, from the GP arena at least, it's time to refer him to the urologist to get further assessed and possibly um, other medicines on authority. And, and if I may, just one other point on that. Um, we're focusing on medication, which is the mainstay, but even sometimes just uh, some fine adjustments of, of lifestyle, lifestyle can often be of benefit. So, you know, if, he, if he's drinking you know, six beers before he goes to bed at night, then that can obviously be pegged back and that'll probably allow him to sleep better. Um, and also caffeine intake is another thing that's worth taking on the history and, and find out just how, much coffee, how many coffees are going in. So you can change lifestyle. Yep. So when would you do surgery on somebody like this? Yeah, so absolutely agree with Dan. Basically, if, you, if you've tried the, med the medical therapy um, and it hasn't worked, um, then he's still bothered, that's when you would consider surgery. And tell us about the pros and cons of surgery, because this is what's called a transurethral resection of the I guess prostate. The, yeah, the gold standard is, is, is still what we would, what would call a TERP, a transurethral resection of the prostate. Um, but we're also sometimes using laser to do a very similar operation. The, the principle of the operation is you're, you're basically removing the obstructing tissue which has been constricting the, the bladder outlet. Um, there, to be honest, there are a fairly few downsides. I mean, one of the downsides is it's an operation. So you have to go to hospital and have an operation. But the risk of incontinence is extremely low um, with, with this surgery. Uh, the risk of erectile dysfunction from this surgery is also very low. But what patients do need to be aware of is, and, and what to expect is that most of them after this operation will have what's called retrograde ejaculation. In other words, at the time of orgasm, instead of semen coming out as it normally would, they may have a, a so-called dry orgasm where, where no fluid comes out or, may, or maybe a whole lot less semen comes out. Is that uncomfortable or just a surprise? No, it, well, it's a surprise if you haven't informed the patient before the operation. <laughs> But it, no, it's typically not uncomfortable, but obviously clearly patients just need to can be Can some of these of alpha blockers do that too? Yeah, absolutely, yes. Yeah. So prazosin and tamsulosin that we talked about before can do it. The difference is that in that situation, you stop the medication, it's reversible. If you have a TERP, then your retrograde ejaculation is typically permanent. I thought there was a study which showed that the, the rate of um, impotence and incontinence was much higher than urologists claim. This was a study last year looking at large series of TERPs that it's that in fact the statistics aren't that much different from um, radical prostatectomies. Well I find that very surprising um, particularly just based on cl my clinical experience and, and that of my colleagues is that we really don't see that. We certainly see it with radical prostatectomy in which we can talk about later on but with a, with a TERP it's that's actually I don't think that's very common. And the re relief of symptoms, because my understanding also is yep. that the degree of bother that you get from the symptoms doesn't necessarily relate to the size of your prostate. You can see a man with a relatively small prostate who's been driven nuts by his symptoms right. and a man with a huge prostate who doesn't care. Right. It's, it, you're right. It's not a one-to-one -one relationship by any means. However, generally speaking, the larger the prostate, the more symptoms. But there are other factors at play, clearly, because um, don't forget women um, have, uh, who don't have prostates 
have a very similar um, prevalence an aging of, phenomenon. of these urinary symptoms. And that's why there's actually a whole other class of medication which we can sometimes use to relax the bladder itself. And that can sometimes be helpful too. So men with a small prostate are obviously not a candidate for a transurethral resection. It's not going to do anything, but sometimes men with a small prostate can have a tight bladder neck. So it's not the prostate gland bulk, it's just a, the tightness of that muscle. And sometimes they can have just a little incision at the bladder neck, nowhere near the sphincter, so it doesn't affect continence. And that can be enough to spring open the bladder neck, reducing um, resistance. And that sometimes can be very helpful for those guys. Marvellous. Let's uh, take any more questions. Um, why is there resistance to a regular PSA by some doctors, especially for men over 40? Question from um, Victoria again. Good question. That's because it's a, it's a very contentious issue. I mean, there, there are some groups that advocate routine PSA screening um, on the chance that we'll catch lots of cancers. And then the majority medical consensus at the moment is, is that um, there's not a role for general population screening of prostate, for prostate cancer. And this is because of overdiagnosis of cancer that might never do any harm? Absolutely. As Jeremy will tell us more, there's, um, or oh, has already been telling us that there's prostate cancer that essentially does nothing or poses very little risk to people. Um, but then, of course, the treatment itself can pose risks of permanent side effects. So let's come back to this. We've got a case study coming up with this that is relevant. Um, and a question for you, Alan, from Victoria, which is, how did, your, how did you find out you had prostate cancer in the first place? What symptoms did you have? What well, problems? I think it's very important for me to say that I had absolutely no symptoms. I went to my doctor for just a, an ordinary blood test, see how I was going, blood pressure. And it was suggested that I should have a PSA and also the digital. And that was the first I knew about the situation. Prostate cancer wasn't on my horizon at all. In fact, it wasn't talked about. So when the results came back, uh, that's when I started my debate with myself about this uh, dreadful decision I had to make. But I'm very glad I made it then and not now because I would be so confused now if I was approaching that decision with everything that I, I hear about it. I think I'd be pacing the floor for the how old were 12 you? months. How old were you, remind me? 59. So you're 59? Yep. So, I mean, it's such a difficult decision anyway, but I suppose in many ways, too much knowledge makes it harder. But it comes back to the point that it's a decision you make for yourself. You decide whether you want to live with that cancer inside you, or if you want to get rid of it like a bad tooth, and if your partner agrees with you, then that's the important thing. Because it has implications for your sexual relationship. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I was made impotent by, by the surgery. And I was told that that was very likely before the surgery because the two nerves that give you the, the erection are in danger of being severed and mine were. I'm told that you can have nerve sparing surgery now. But I was back in the dark ages, don't forget. I mean, you know, just whack, gone. So while we're on about this, um, you know, there's this guy, Patrick Walsh at Johns Hopkins, who's pioneered nerve sparing surgery. I think I've heard of him, yeah. And um, <laughs> who claims that he gets the world's lowest rates of uh, erectile dysfunction. Yeah. And I've yet to find a urologist who believes that, uh, with all due respect to them. You know, they, they may just have a select group of patients there at Johns Hopkins. But I mean, just the, on this nerve sparing surgery, yeah. um, does it make any difference? I mean, yes. uh, urologists tell me that 90% of men are going to be, uh, um, um, have erectile dysfunction after a radical prostatectomy, and if the bundle of nerves goes through the middle of the prostate, you're gone anyway. So, uh, nerve sparing does make a difference, but um, what's important for patients approaching their surgery to realise is that even if you're having nerve sparing surgery, you're still at significant risk of erectile dysfunction. Now, Surgeons perhaps will quote different percentages, perhaps based on their own data, but it's probably around 50-50. So even if you spare both the nerves, you might still have a significant erectile dysfunction, and I think that's an important point. Now, there are some cases where, particularly if you have high-grade disease, where the surgeon will deliberately not spare the nerves, 
because you want to do a maximal resection and, and give yourself the best possible chance of, of removing all the cancer cells. And in that situation, you can certainly expect to not have any erections at all. But this is another point that I think is worth mentioning, and that is that um, we do have very effective treatments for erectile dysfunction. Now, of course, it's not a natural erection. It's very different. But as long as we've had a really good reason to remove the prostate or irradiate the prostate, then I think you know that's the that's the balance we're trying to achieve. And some men do recover. Yep. And my understanding is it's your erectile function before the operation is the strongest predictor. Yeah, absolutely. Very important. Pre-op um, erectile function and age are the most important predictors for post-op erectile function. So, so regardless of the operation, if you've done well, if, you've, if you're young and fit and have good erectile function, you stand the best chance of getting it back. Not if they cut the nerves. Exactly. As long as you've had a nerve sparing procedure. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And what about, uh, we're jumping the gun here, but what about um, the, the seeds, what's called brachytherapy, when you yeah. actually put radioactive seeds in the gland and don't take it out? Uh, in terms of side effects, do you mean? Yes, or? and results. Yeah, so um, unfortunately we don't have any top-level evidence or randomised control trials comparing surgery to what you're describing, brachytherapy or a, a version of radiotherapy. But what we can say is that they appear to be roughly equivalent in terms of cure rates. Now, it also depends on what sort of cancer you're talking about. But if we're just talking about the typical intermediate risk, then they appear to be equivalent. Where they differ is in the side effect profile. It's, I think it's important to realise both types of treatments have side effects. But they're just they're a bit different. different. They're, they're different types, yeah. So, for example, surgery has you know, urinary incontinence that we've talked about, erectile dysfunction. Brachytherapy or seed implantation has erectile dysfunction. Less incontinence of urine, it should be said, but because the prostate's being irradiated, there, there can be a radiation dose to the bladder base and to the front wall of the rectum. Now, that's uncommon, but if that occurs, you can get uh, rectal symptoms such as urgency and frequency of opening the bowels and similar types of symptoms for the bladder as well. Which can settle, but there's a lower rate of erectile dysfunction, isn't there? Slightly, yeah. I don't think it's a huge difference, um, but, but there is generally a lower rate of erectile dysfunction. But that also depends on whether hormone therapy is used as well. And often, when, when having brachytherapy, hormone therapy will also be given for a period of time. And of course, when you're on hormone therapy, it's very likely, at least for that period, that your erectile function and, and your libido as well will be knocked off. I was told that if brachytherapy had been available, that's what would have been recommended to me. Right. It wasn't in Australia at the time. Let's go to our next case study. Daryl's 56 years old. He's fine. His father died of prostate cancer when he was uh, 65, and uh, his mates have told him you better get in to have it checked up, not to mention his wife. Hmm. Now's the time to open the conversation about prostate screening with Daryl, um, weighing up the risks and benefits and what suits him and his partner. So he's not a normal man, though. He's got a family history. Yes, but um, Which the puts issues, him at a bit of increased risk. Mind you, the issues remain the same. Daryl is still facing the risks of permanent um, side effects from any cancer we may diagnose through screening. And although um, on the face of it, it seems great that we might diagnose a cancer we didn't know about, as Jeremy's been saying earlier, many cancers actually don't need to be treated. And by identifying a whole load of ones that didn't need treated, we're ethically obliged to treat some of them and will cause problems as well. So the figures are about only about one in a thousand men benefit. You know, you've got a PSA screen about a thousand men for one to benefit. That's about the numbers, isn't it? Yeah, similar to that. Yeah. So those are the sorts of conversations you need. Mm. So let's say one in a thousand men benefits from the PSA screen, but what proportion of those thousand men do suffer permanent irreversible side effects? And which of those men um, would rather have died than to have those side effects. For many men, you know, um, erectile function is a very important part of life, um, amongst other things, continence as well. Um, and so really, it's a, it's a um, question that only the man himself and his partner can weigh up, which is why it's got to be a conversation, a partnership between the patient and the doctor and not a prescribed blanket rule for everyone. So, Stuart, what do you tell men who ask you your, their advice about PSA testing? Yeah, um, that's a really good question because um, I, every week I would get two or three, whether they be referral from a urologist, to discuss 
um, you know, someone who is potentially diagnosed with prostate cancer, or people who would come into the clinic and say, yes, or, you know, what do you think? Um, and like Dan said, you have to weigh up all the options. You have to look at their partnership and discuss what uh, potential um, risks are associated with and, and, and really what sits behind both of the comments that you're making is that actually it's the decision to have the test is a momentous one. Yeah. Because once you know what it is, you're kind of forced into action. Yeah, in a way, you, you choose. And I mean, we counsel people, just as we counsel people about you know, going in to have a radical prostatectomy or to have brachytherapy or whatever, it's about showing them this versus this and, uh, and giving them the full spectrum of side effects, the full the spectrum of potential outcomes and also the potential out outcomes if you do nothing. So it, without telling the patient what to do, you've got to basically put the cards on the table and say, well, this is where we are. And I have the liberty of you know, talking to patients for 45 minutes or an hour and their wives. And it's, that's far better than um, you know, a quick, g'day, yeah, how you going? Yeah. Mm. Norman, if I can just make a comment, I'm not sure if I agree with that uh, about being forced into action, because even if, even if a PSA comes back, you can still then, you still then have the option of making a decision as to where, what you do with that PSA. And okay, I think so let's play it out with Daryl. His right. PSA comes back at 4.5. Mm -hmm. so and he's got a family history. Yeah, so, so you know, that's elevated for his age group. He's in, he's in his 50s. He's got a positive family history. Let's say even if his rectal examination's benign feeling, um, my first uh, reaction to that would be to order a repeat PSA and I would do that because we do see a lot of natural fluctuation in the PSA. Because they've got prostatitis that might be high. That they might have, they might have a, a period of temporary um, inflammation of the prostate, might not even be symptomatic, but that can happen. So I'd get him back in say six weeks, eight weeks with a repeat PSA along with a free to total ratio that we talked about before and if it remains, if it's a sustained elevation, um, then I would say well given your other risks, I would recommend proceeding to a biopsy. But then tell him about the risks associated with the biopsy and what the results of the biopsy might indicate. So let's talk about biopsy because this is just another sort of unknown area. So you've got urologists who do the biopsies through the rectum and there's an instance of septicemia and infection as a result of that. If you look at actually from Johns Hopkins, they claim quite high rates of problems from prostates. Yep. You've got urologists in Australia who will do it through the perineum, through the skin, mm -hmm. into the prostate gland, but that's longer and requires a bit of an anaesthetic. Yep. And some people will do eight punches, some people will do 10, some people yep. will do 12, some people will do 24. Yep. This is like you know, wild west exactly, out there. It's not exactly standardised, is it? No. It's a problem. Um, and the more, and the more biopsies you do, the more likely you are to find something that doesn't mean anything. Um, whilst that's true, um, you're also more likely to find uh, aggressive cancer that you might have otherwise missed. So it's what we do with the information rather than saying, oh, let's not even find out. Let's decide, let's get the information and then work out what we're going to do. So for example, and, and I think this is a really crucial point, is let's say we do a biopsy and it comes back as only a small volume of low-grade prostate cancer. Now that guy would be an ideal candidate um, for active surveillance. In other words, we recognise that we've found what we call low-grade prostate cancer, but of itself, it's not harmful. Now, it might change, it might progress over time, or there might even be other more aggressive prostate cancer adjacent to it within the, within the gland. So we're not saying, it's fine, forget, a, forget about it, we won't need to see you again. We're saying, we're going to keep an eye on you, but we're not going to harm you with surgery or radiotherapy and, and its potential side effects because we don't think that what you've got warrants that. I mean, I once interviewed the head of prostate surgery at Memorial Sloan Kettering yep. who gets referrals from urologists. He's like the, the quaternary, you know, yep. the, the, the last stage. Yep. And he reckons he cuts the rate of, well, cuts the wrong word, but you know, he reduces the rate of radical prostatectomy by about a half Correct. by taking that kind of approach. Absolutely. So uh, you're relatively, un so do you think that Australian urologists are taking that approach too? I, 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 I don't think it, I know it, um, because we've got data that's published um, in the MJA just recently actually saying that we are taking on active surveillance. In fact, we're probably, you know, without beating our own drum too much, we're probably world leaders 
one of the world leaders in terms of nations in this area. And I think whilst we should be, at one, on, on the one hand, we should be proud of that, on the other, we still need to do better. So talk, so there are some tools that urologists use to add, add all this up, you know, the results of your biopsy and so on. Take us through the various predictive tools that there are that you can use to actually assess a man's risk, right. either of needing surgery or the progressing or yep. what have you. Yep, so there's certainly a few predictors or these, these tools that you mentioned out there um, and they're available freely on the internet. Yeah, we've so, got them up on the graphic here. Yeah, so, so this, this particular one, the R ARSPC, is out of Europe and it's based on a huge volume of, of data. And what it means is that you can plug in the, uh, the numbers that are, uh, apply to you. So your age, your PSA, um, what the rectal examination felt like by the doctor, and, ev and if you've had a biopsy, even what the biopsy results were, and it were, and it'll spit out a percentage of, for example, what's your chance of having an aggressive prostate cancer, what's your chance of having what we call an indolent prostate cancer, in other words, one that's not harmful, that we can safely observe, um, or even if you've had treatment, what's the chance of your cancer coming back? So they're, they're freely available, and, and I, think, I think I'd recommend them to patients. And you use them yourself in your practice? I do, not all the time, I have to say, um, because uh, it really is patient dependent. I think if individuals want to go down that track, then I certainly um, either direct them towards that or even, even go through it during a consultation. But many, many men will not be bothered with it. So quick, choice. quick questions, we're running out of time here. My father had prostate cancer, what should I do for prevention in terms of testing, please? I'm currently 32, so, Stuart? 32, is that mm -hmm. right? Uh, 32, certainly, I think it just keeps it in the back of his mind at this stage. He at least accesses his GP for a, or health professional for a regular health check and starts doing that um, of a religious nature, maybe every, at 32, probably every couple of years. And then after 40, probably broach the, the question, get some reassurance from the GP or health professional. And then I think probably by 45 to 50, start at least. And how many relatives start to score a very high risk of? I think of it's after a second uh, relative. So if it's a father and uncle or an older brother, father and an older brother. Right, so yeah, first so once you're starting to get to those, yeah. You particularly diagnosed at an early age. You need to start taking right. more notice of it. I mean, a yeah. single first degree relative will certainly bump up your risk. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then that Step multiplies two, if, yeah. you've got, if you've got a couple. If prostate cancer is an age-related disease, what happens with our levels of testosterone as we get older, and does this influence the likelihood of prostate cancer developing? From Victoria as well, a lot of Victorian viewers tonight. Yeah, that's, that's a really tricky one. I mean, the testosterone level as, as men age does change, and it usually does slowly decline. But Dave should listen to the Health Report on Radio National three weeks ago, where yeah. I had David Handelsman on, where healthy men yep. of the age of 80 have the testosterone levels of younger men. If you're healthy, and if you're healthy, fit, if you're the right. testosterone doesn't decline. Yeah. So and the relationship between testosterone, because there's a relationship between testosterone and prostate cancer, isn't there? Well, it's, there is in as much as the hormone therapy, for example, is what we use if, if a patient has metastatic prostate cancer. And, and, that's, and that's designed to knock out the testosterone or prevent it from working. So we know that there's a relationship. But in, in terms of an undiagnosed man, whether he's having testosterone supplements or not, um, you know, we still don't know the answer to that. Look, that's been fantastic. We've learned lots tonight. That's been great. Very quickly, what are your take home messages? Um, so I guess my single take home message would be, um, if you're a man in your 50s or 60s, even if you don't have any urinary symptoms, um, and this is along, along with the, the guidelines that are currently coming out of Australia and New Zealand, just have a chat to your GP about your prostate, about the possibility of PSA testing, just to see if it's right for you. It may not be, but there's a chance that it will be. And so I think it's worth at least a discussion. Alan? Well, it still remains a very personal decision that you take with your family, if that's relevant. But the closer we get to being able to say that's an aggressive cancer that will kill you, that won't, the more this dilemma will fade. Stuart? Yeah, I think you need to look at prostate health for the whole three uh, issues, not just prostate cancer, not just enlargement, prostatitis. Talk to your health professional, GP, and keep well informed. Use people who are reputable. Yeah. Dan? Very much in agreement with the other gentleman tonight. If you have symptoms, go ask your GP, talk to him about it, him or her, and um, work in partnership with them to find out what's best for you. And just finally, there are cultural issues in some groups, particularly Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, which you need to be sensitive to as a, as a practitioner. Yes. We thank you all very much and thank you for watching. If you're interested in obtaining more information about the issues raised tonight or would like to watch the program again, 
you can go to Rural Health Education Foundation's website, rhef.com.au. Click on the program page, Prostate Health, taking it seriously. If you're a health professional, don't forget to complete your CPD evaluation form, which can be completed online. You'll receive a certificate of attendance and, if eligible, CPD points. Our thanks to the Department of Health and Ageing for making this program possible, but special thanks to you for taking the time to watch and contribute so fert fertilely, or whatever the word is, to our discussion today. We'd appreciate your feedback on the program. Your comments are very important to us. Let us know you watched by sending us an email, text or tweet, and feel free to share your views. We'd love to hear them. I'm Norman Swan. Goodbye till next time, and join us again soon on the Rural Health Channel.